So in the 1990s, when we got back into power in, in the UK, we did it through policy. But this time, I think it's just as likely to start with organizing. Because organizing is actually not just a technique for campaigning. It's something that teaches us a huge amount about what our ideas should be. It keeps our language real and our offer relevant. And it might even start to find the next generation of leaders who aren't Oxbridge educated ex special advisors like me. It might actually try and find the successors to Bevin and Bevan, people who can speak Judean as a first language. Now, Alinsky wrote to Rules for Radicals in despair at the waste of energy of the student movements of the 60s and 70s, in despair of people having fantastic protests and demonstrations, but which ended up losing every time. Alinsky was trying to say to people, why don't you try and win for a change? Why don't you try and use the same energy to get into a relationship with people who have power and make sure that they have to do at least part of what you say? And that is where London Citizens, or Citizens UK, the British branch of the IAF come in. The Sydney Alliance is their Australian cousin. Now quite a lot of us in the Labour Party have now gone on their five day training. And what you realize when you get there is that they are also a relative. They're also a family cousin. Because the techniques which they use would have been very familiar to an early trade unionist in the dock strike in East London in 1889, or indeed to the founders of the Labour Party back at home in the UK, or indeed, uh, as Jenny was saying, here in Australia. And that route of good community organizing is very simple. It's relationships. And their technique is also very simple. It's essentially about 45-minute meetings where you talk to people about what makes them angry, about what they'd like to change. It's not a team meeting. It's not an interview. It's not data gathering. It's not a breakout group. It's a conversation. And those relationships existed pretty naturally in our old constituencies, in the old industrial towns and cities. Those relationships came out of the very fabric of those communities. And I think many people now have given up and have thought that those relationships have gone with the factories. But actually what community organizing teaches us is that those relationships can be rebuilt if you're prepared to put the hard work in, if you're prepared to sit down with people, listen to them, talk to them, and then build a common interest with them. Now, back in the UK, the best example that we've had is the campaign for the living wage, which has been a huge, a huge success. And that campaign itself came out of a number of weekends which London citizens organized after the GFC to talk to people about what they wanted. And what came out of those hundreds of one-to-ones wasn't actually a demand for more equality for a higher GDP. What came out was that people wanted to see their kids more that they were spending too much time working two jobs because they weren't earning enough money, that they were coming home too late, leaving too early, and that they never got to see their kids or indeed their partners. They were a disparate lot in those weekends. They were nuns and Quakers and imams, mums and students, cockneys and immigrants. And in another setting, those are exactly people who could have found an awful lot to divide them from each other. But by the end of the weekend, by talking to each other and by listening to each other, they'd done the opposite. They had built a common interest and they had agreed to fight for it. In other words, they had built relationships based on reciprocity, mutualism, and trust. And that is just about as good a definition of what it means to be labor as I could ever give. Reciprocity, that we look out for each other. Mutualism, that we all put into the pot. Trust, that we know that others will be there for us and won't take us for a ride. And in fact, it's the trust which is the magic ingredient, the bit that makes the welfare state work and the bit that makes it fail when it's lost. A belief that we've all put in to it, but that the welfare state will be there when we need it. You could almost call it a labor state of grace, and we have fallen from it. Because although we thought we were renewing the covenant with the people in our reforms of welfare, they thought that we were breaking it. What we said that we were doing in the name of fairness they thought was the very opposite. They felt that people were getting help who hadn't paid in, and they thought that people who needed protection weren't getting it. And actually, I'd go further. I'd say that as progressives, we'd almost started to sound as if we were telling people that we couldn't protect them. We would say to people that they didn't want a handout, that they wanted a hand up instead, that we couldn't protect their old job, 
but we could help them get their next job. And the problem with that is it sounds rather hollow when the economy goes south. Because actually saying to people that you can't protect their old job, but you can't get them another one, is not much of an offer. In that situation, what people want actually is a handout. And the problem was in Britain that when they actually came to rely on the welfare state when they lost their job, they found that all that they got was 65 pounds a week for six months, and then after that, only means-tested benefits. And it's from understanding how angry that would make you after you paid in all your life that you can start to renew your policy. And what you might end up with was an approach to welfare which actually started from the real risks that people face today and how you could actually protect them from them. So for example, it would mean guaranteeing people a job if they couldn't find one for themselves after a year. It might mean that they'd have a proportion of their wages of protection after they lost their job rather than 65 pounds a week. It would mean uh, that people would want a guarantee of housing, of a pension in retirement, of good parental leave and pay. That's the kind of welfare state that people might actually fight for rather than treating with indifference at best and contempt at worst. Of course, that would need money, and the way that I would suggest funding it would be out of the cash transfers and the universal benefits that people don't value particularly in good times and find to be marginal, but find to be insufficient in bad times. Such a welfare state would explore how we can bring back the contributory principle, how what people get out of the welfare state relates better to what they put in. But it would also be more demanding as well as more supportive and would say that people couldn't refuse to help themselves and that that job guarantee would actually be a job requirement, that if you didn't take the job, you would lose your benefits. An approach to the economy that grew out of, la of this labor tradition would shape capitalism rather than taking it as it is. It would be enthusiastic about the potential of markets, but it would recognize their potential, and their potential to fail catastrophically. And a much more protective welfare state would obviously be part of that response to the possibility that markets fail. But it wouldn't be just about state action. And I think another thing that as progressives we didn't do enough in the last few years was to ask ourselves fundamental questions about markets. We were very good at looking how you redistributed the money but less good at looking about how you could change the distribution which the market delivered in the first place. And this is exactly the issue which Ed Miliband back home has identified in talking about the squeeze middle, in talking about the stagnant wages of uh, middle and lower income uh, workers. And I think our old response would be just have said, let's give people a tax credit to change their post-tax and benefit income. But we now need to look at how markets work afresh, and that's exactly why in the UK, IPPR is launching a project on exactly that issue, about how we can protect through markets that life proper to human beings, with wages growing much further down the income scale, where people feel in control and respected at work, but also one in which we ask ourselves much more how we can have private sector growth, not just in financial services, as we did in the UK, but outside of London and outside of financial services. Now that's how revisiting our tradition might help us to renew ourselves. But that blue, blue labor tradition by itself isn't enough. By itself, it would end up just being about protection. And it's where blue labor needs its own cousin. It's where blue labor needs its progressive cousin. It's where blue labor needs aspiration. Because actually the mistake in that Clinton soundbite isn't about saying that people, pe that people want a hand up. They do want a hand up. The mistake was forgetting that they also sometimes do need a handout, that people want a handout and then a hand up. Blue Labour needs its progressive cousin, Central Insight, that modern politics is about giving people power, and that that's what progressives got absolutely right in the last 20 years. In conferences like this, we would talk about empowerment. It was a great guide to policy. It was a good summary of our ideology. But it failed as a slogan. I don't know about you, but we would never talk to people about giving them power when we were on their doorstep. We would give them the list, which I talked about earlier. Gordon Brown didn't say to Mrs. Duffy, oh, but I've empowered you. And that's a highly revealing thing. And it wasn't because we didn't mean it. It wasn't because it was the wrong idea. It wasn't because of any of those things. It was because we hadn't actually delivered it. We hadn't actually made her feel more powerful about her life. And the reason for that was because we had relied entirely on the state to do it rather than 
reforming markets to complement that. We hadn't made people powerful because we had forgotten how markets can crash and how they can exploit people. But if we put protection and aspiration back together, maybe we can make that promise of empowerment real. Maybe we could say to people with a straight face that they will have the power to live the life they want, to live a life proper to human beings. Maybe we could have an argument that would unite the different parts of our coalition, working class and middle class, native and immigrant, rather than seeking different messages like a patchwork for different parts of the electorate. And maybe then they would want to join our parties again and fight with us, because they would understand that these are not rights conferred from on high, but protections won by politics and which have to be won again in each generation. And in community organizing, we have the techniques which can make that true too. Techniques which teach us how to go from making a noise to winning our battles. Not just a few of us politicians having power at the center on the back of other people's votes, but people themselves feeling a real difference in the power they have over their lives through the way their communities work, their markets work, and their public services work. That is how we can escape the progressive paradox. Not by importing a new set of abstract ideas, but by going back to our traditions, the labor tradition, which when properly expressed, are the sublime common sense of the Australian and British peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you.